I am going to crash out if I see one more person post this photo. So you probably heard React just had three major security vulnerabilities and I'm not a React stan, but I do know how React server components work. I do know how this hack works. And I think that most of you are wrong about this. So buckle up, I'm gonna educate you. A couple incorrect narratives going on. So first one is that this code here is rendering out client side and either sending that code to the server to run or that you're mixing client side code and server side code. Neither of those are true. Second one is uh, the React to shell, that's what the new security vulnerabilities are called, um, is because of client side and server side mixing and other frameworks like Tansac Start or SvelteKit don't do that. That's incorrect as well. And finally, people are saying there's too much magic with, with React server components where you don't know where your code is running and, and that is going to cause some serious security vulnerabilities in the future and that is what caused that. That is also incorrect. So let's let's dive into it. Let's start with the code in the screenshot. That code is running 100% server side. None of the code that exists in that screenshot, I've recreated it here, will ever make it to the browser. You can't use any client side features, no state, no hooks, no click handers. Allow me to show you. So I have this here and I'm doing something you should only be able to do server side. I'm checking for free memory on my computer, right? If you try to do things that are client side ish, like add a click handler, right? You're going to get an error. Consider converting this part to a client component. Um, if you are doing things like React State, you're going to get an actual error. You're not, it's not accidentally going to send all of this code to the client side. It, it will be able to detect that. So the way that this works is React is rendering out the HTML on the server and sending that from the server to the browser. It's technically not HTML. It's kind of component parts, but you can think of it as the same way. Now, with this form action, it's going to wire up the submit of that button or of the form element to an HTTP endpoint, exactly like you probably have done in PHP or any other framework before. What is this form action? Oh, they're adding custom set. No, that is a standard HTML attribute. Form action will overwrite it. In fact, the screenshot of this doesn't even work if you just render it on out. You have to first wrap the entire thing in a form tag. So here I have a form tag and this is my bookmark component inside of it. When you go click on it, it will submit the data. Now React will try to intercept that with JavaScript and not give yourself a full page reload, but it works without, uh, without JavaScript enabled at all. Watch this. I'm going to go to the Node.js version of this page. I'm going to open up my console here. And if I click on this, You'll see I'm actually just changing and fully reloading the page and that data is being run. So everybody who thinks, oh, don't send, don't run so much JavaScript on the client. This is no JavaScript at all. It's it's simply just sending uh, post requests to a server and handling them accordingly. Now, you're probably in the comments being like, oh, it's too easy to mix things and you're going to have trouble. We'll get into that in just a second, but let's talk about the actual React hack, the React to shell, right? Because I posted about this on Twitter being like, this is this is not it. And all the replies were like, you're defending the thing that was just hacked. This is not what just broke. React server components, sending stuff from the client to the server is not what just broke. So the React hack, here's how it works. React allows you to talk between the client and the server, sending and receiving payloads between the client and the browser. Those payloads, they could be data, but they also can be server rendered components, much like we just looked at right here. I have another one here called file list where it simply just reads the files from my computer, renders them out inside of a div. This is not happening client side and it is not sending the entire node FS package to the client side. So you can think of it as just a server sending HTML to the client like we've been doing for 100 years, like you probably have done with PHP for many, many years. Now, React is also really big on performance. They want you to send the data back and forth as fast as possible, sometimes before things are even done. So this might look like an LLM sending a chat as it is being generated. Um, it might be like sending parts of your website that are already done rendering, like your navigation or things in your footer, while other parts of your website that are currently being worked on, maybe slower parts, are still being rendered. React wants to be able to stream in the UI as fast as possible so you can render things that are ready already while other p pieces are being worked. And this is really big in all the AI space right now because AI sometimes takes a while, but you can start reading that response 
as it's being rendered. Now, because React has this wait for no one attitude, they have to use what's called streaming for both the data and their components. And this means that chunks of data are being sent to and from the server as they are ready. And to do this, React had to come up with their own transport protocol. So they've invented their own protocol for sending chunks of data to and from the browser. Now, here's how the hack actually works. React sends the stream in the form of a promise. And when the promise is finished, React calls a dot then method on it, right? You have a promise, you wait for it to be done. And then when it is done, you call the dot then. Now, normally, promises do not have their own dot then methods. The, what they do is they look up the prototype chain and they use the one from the, their constructor. But since everything in JavaScript is an object, it means that you can overwrite and add your own instance to any of the methods. Let me show you a little example here. So, and I'm going to create a new string, right? We have Wes. And then Wes has methods on it, like uh, to uppercase, right? That is a method. And the instance of Wes, the instance of the Wes, the string, does not have its own to uppercase method. It, it just simply borrows the one or it looks up the prototype chain and uses the one from its constructor, the big S string that made it. Now, because everything in JavaScript is an object, you can actually overwrite the methods that live on an object. So in this case, I am adding my own to uppercase method and then console logging hacked. Now, when I take my string, which is Wes, and I call a method like to uppercase, because I have overwritten, or not necessarily overwritten, but because I have added my own to uppercase method to the prototype of Wes, now I am running my own version of it. And the hack in React was that they, they were able to figure out how to send a malicious payload that was sent from the client to the server that overwrote the dot then method and was then executed. So React implemented their own protocol where there was a vulnerability that allowed a malicious payload to be sent and override a promises dot then with custom code, thus allowing remote code execution. You're not supposed to be, and let me say this very clearly, you're not supposed to be able to do that. You are not supposed to be able to send code from the client to the server that should be then executed on the server. You're supposed to be able to send data objects, but because of the way that they were streaming chunks as a promise, they found a way that you could overwrite it. And the fix was very simple. You were just simply checking if that promise had its own instance of then. And if that's the case, then somebody was monkeying with it and not actually using the one up the prototype chain. Look at this one. Uh, I think the problem is that it opened the door for all kinds of attacks we've been seeing here lately. Security in server-side languages is expected, but here it gets harder to prevent because mixing front and back end code gets pretty complicated. That is not what happened right here. Let me say it again. This hack had nothing to do with the mixing of client side and server side code. This isn't because somebody got confused and accidentally imported some server code into a client. This is simply just a server API that React had created and it had a security flaw where when sent a malicious payload, it was able to remotely execute code. Now, I'm not trying to dunk on these people because I honestly think it's a fair complaint. And many of the complaints of React Server Components are that it's it's difficult to understand. You can see it. All of these replies are people that don't actually know how it works. Um, and I believe some of the frustration with React Server Components is because of the ergonomics of trying to keep your client code and your server code separate. So let's talk about how React Server Components works. One, there's three things. One, all components by default our server component. So if I just go and make a random ass component right here, what I've done is I have read the files from it. I don't actually need this use server here. That is for server functions. If I remove that and give it a save, this thing still works and it is still 100% server rendered, right? So you're not accidentally going to do it. If you then want to opt in to something that is done in the client, you go to your file that it is and you mark that file as use client. And then if you try to do things that are servery um, inside of a client component, it's going to yell at you, right? It, in this case, it's saying like 
okay, that doesn't exist. You can't use node APIs in here. Your bundler is going to catch that. Or if you do have use server in one of these, you're going to get a different error, which is you can't use use server inside of a client component, right? You would have to make a totally separate component and a totally separate file that would, would do the server bits and then a separate one that would do all of the client bits. Now, the third one is this little use server here. This is, this is probably what confuses a lot of people. So server by default, client side opt-in, but then why do we have this use server function right here? So what you do with that use server function is if you have a function that should only ever be called on the server, but you want to call that function from the client, normally what, what would you do, right? You would probably set up an API and make a fetch request and ping that API endpoint, and then it would run it and return some data. Or you'd set up like an RPC, something like that, where your, your RPC will, will run those functions, right? That's, it's kind of the same ideas that, that are happening here. And then probably lots of you are saying right now something like this is, oh, well, you just mark it as use client on top, or you could accidentally mark something as use client, and then you are in trouble. Well, like right here, I have my root. This is my page here. So by default, that is server rendered, right? So if I put a, a use client on there to switch it over, right, it's going to throw an error. Or if I try to put use client on one of these things that shouldn't be, you're going to get an error. I showed you that. It's very hard to accidentally do that. And in fact, all of the bundlers go take it even a step further and will do things like if you want to use an environmental variable um, and you want that to be in the bundle of your client side code, you must explicitly mark it with like a V underscore or next underscore, all of those things. It's very hard to get your environmental variables accidentally leaked into client side code. See this one as well. I'm tired of all the React hacks. I'm moving to Tansac Start. I'm moving to SvelteKit. I'm moving to something else. So Tansac Start was not vulnerable because they don't support React server components. And their protocol is not made up. It's just standard HTTP get post put requests. And web standards by using those are, are generally a little bit more battle tested. The difference with Tansac Start is that everything is client rendered by default and they don't currently have a way to server render single components. You just server render an entire page, and then you can hydrate on the client. Because of this implementation, they only need to stream data back and forth to the back end and not actually components. That's why React had to come up with its own implementation um, protocol to send data and components back and forth. So Tansac Start is actually fantastic. I love it. I recommend that you check it out for your next project. However, if you are saying right now, um, you should not be mixing client and server logic, um, I got bad news for you because the way that Tansac Start denotes what a function is, is not with use server. It's simply with a function just called create server function, which quite honestly, I like that a little bit better than um, your, your fancy strings. But you can put these in the same file as your client side code. In fact, go to the bottom here. It says right here, note, server functions use a compilation process that extracts server code from client bundles while maintaining seamless calling patterns. So it does exactly what React Server Components does in regards of, oh, that is a server function. I'm not actually going to send the code to run the server function to the client. I'm going to replace it with an HTTP call that will then just hit an API endpoint on the server and then send the data back. SvelteKit does the exact same thing. If you take a look at their new implementation, of remote functions. It's still experimental. So the way that it works is that instead of saying use server, you have a special file with a dot remote inside of it and data.remote.js, right? This is where you do all of your server logic. Then you export that get post. And then guess what you do with that server function? You import it into <laughs> your client framework and then you're able to go ahead and use it. What? Oh, the big security issue. This is awesome. I love RPC. I love this. And I obviously it's a little bit dicey. You're like, oh, it's kind of weird importing server stuff into the client. The bundlers are going to take care of it. At least I hope, right? This, this is how much of the internet is, is run on. And because JavaScript runs client side and server side, it's very nice to get all the types flow through. All of that stuff just work. You don't have to set up a whole bunch of API endpoints. 
Oh, but Wes, what about separation of concerns? We would never do that in PHP. The two major frameworks we have an MVC approach. We have a beautiful separation of concerns, right? Or I, I, I understand there's no security vulnerability, but why would you want to put SQL and HTML together? Is that desirable? No, it, it's probably not desirable. You do want some separation of concerns. Um, you want to be able to probably put your code that is server running and all of your logic in reusable functions in one file and then simply just import them into what you want. That screenshot was taken out of context and it was just showing you that you can run and mix these things together. Should you? Probably not. Oh, but there's a huge SQL injection error. No, of course, these, these things right here, these are called tag template literals. And of course, any input that comes from your user, you should treat as a potential attack. And if you are taking user input and embedding them directly into SQL queries, then yeah, you're probably going to have a bad time. You're going to get SQL injected. But this right here, this little tag template literal, what does that do? It, it sanitizes the data that's coming in, right? Well, this is just the same way as running a SQL query through a function that, that checks if there is anything bad and it sanitizes all of the possible injections that are happening right here. So this hack, it's extremely unfortunate and it really shows the benefit of picking standardized battle tested technologies. The the guys who are running uh, like Java Spring right now are punching the air right now because like that tech has been around forever. React Server Components created an entirely new protocol to send it. And unfortunately that meant that there was a security vulnerability. I'm as mad as the rest of you are. But much of this React Server component has nothing to do with mixing client and server code. And it has to do with people not taking 67 minutes to understand how this stuff works. AI is making you dumb. You have free will, folks. Go and check out how things work. Don't just scan tweets and think that's how all of this stuff works. You're getting brain rotted.